Hey guys, Spudknocker here, as always, and welcome on back to DCS World. Today I figured I'd hop in and do a quick and dirty video, not allowing myself to do a million takes or a bazillion edits to make the video absolutely perfect. I've grown into a bit of a perfectionist, and sometimes it can be very difficult to make awesome videos for you guys that you guys really, really want to watch. And because of this, I just wanted to kind of go over a really cool story and kind of do a bit of a story time for you guys as you watch me fly uh, here in DCS World in just a nice, relaxed flight and relaxed setting. Um, last night or either early this morning, my channel hit 29,000 subscribers, and that is a pretty cool milestone right before a really big milestone of 30,000 subscribers. And I just wanted to take this time to say thank you to all the viewers out there who support the channel, liking the video, subscribing to videos, all this kind of stuff. And I really also really, really want to thank my uh, Patreon uh, subscribers who really help support the channel. You know, because of this, uh, a few weeks ago, my entire PC just up and died on me. Just went kaput. Like, the, it was kind of a long time coming. I could see the performance of the computer was going down, the RAM was getting sketchy, all this kind of stuff. And honestly, it was awesome that I had the funds available because of my patrons to allow myself to go and build a new computer and still be able to make awesome videos for you guys. Without you guys' support, the channel really honestly would not be going anymore. Um, I also want to make a big shout out to the new channel sponsor. Um, that's going to be Leading Edge Supplements and their awesome, awesome product, Severe Clear. It's a company and a product made by pilots and for pilots. And you can use code SPUD for 15% off. And like I've said before, guys, I'm not a crazy person like a crazy, insane Alex Jones type forcing pills and shit on you guys. It's just a really awesome product that... Uh, you know, is by pilots and for pilots, some U.S. Air Force guys, and, you know, it uh, it works really well. It helps me get through a lot of flights a day and then come back and make some videos for you guys. And so, um, like I said, just big thank you to everyone who supports the channel, and uh, why don't we go ahead and hop right into our story time here. You guys may have been thinking, why in the world, Spud, do you have an Israeli F-15 sitting next to an Imperial Iranian Air Force F-14A Tomcat? And I wanted to kind of go over the story of why Iran picked the F-14 and why Israel picked the F-15. Being the giant airplane nerd that I am and, and military aviation military history major, um, I've written a bunch of papers, pretty exhaustive papers, on the 1982 Lebanon War. And I've also been extremely interested in reading about and researching the Iranian Air Force because they fly such an interesting and cool hodgepodge of jets. And so uh, why don't we just go ahead and hop right into the story here. One quick thing that I wanted to point out is all of your F-14B skins that you've acquired and curated over the lifespan of the F-14Bs thus far, all you gotta do is just copy and paste those same skins right into your F-14A liveries folder and boom, they will work perfectly. And it's really nice to see this Imperial Iranian Air Force skin on this beautiful F-14A Tomcat from Heatler, of course. So we'll go ahead and hop into the cockpit here, and we're just gonna fly some easy, basic touch and goes, just some nice, relaxed flying in DCS World here. Sometimes you just gotta sit back and relax and enjoy flying, whether that's in DCS World or you're flying, doing some pattern work in real life as well. So kind of getting back to our storyline here, the Iranian Air Force and the Israeli Air Force are very similar in their historical like coming abouts if you could say especially they especially parallel each other very very well in the early 1960s throughout the 1979 1980-ish period right when of course the imperial iranian air force turned into the islamic republic of iran air force it's also important to note here that the shah of iran um reza pavlavi was a pilot himself and a giant pilot and airplane nerd just like you guys are watching this video and of course i am as well and i was down talking to some friends the other day about the f-14 and comparing and contrasting it to the f-15 and the idea came up as to talking about why did israel pick the f-15 and why did iran pick the f-14 
So let's go ahead and take a look at the F10 map and look at our taxi instructions here. So it looks like we're going to be taxiing, you know, but following the center line here out to the right and then making a pretty steep left hand turn and then coming down taxiing to runway 34. So let's go ahead and start the taxi as we kind of discuss this topic in more depth. Of course, we all know that in, during the 1960s, the Israeli Air Force, for the most part, was supplied by the French, flying Mirage 3s, Mystiers, etc. Um, mostly French aircraft through the late 1950s through the 1960s, with the United States kind of coming online in terms of being an arms supplier for Israel during the late 1960s, with the first American aircraft fielded by the um, Israelis, other than, of course, you know, the hodgepodge of World War II surplus airplanes flown during the Independence War, was the A-4 Skyhawk. And we can kind of think of this period kind of mirroring, mirroring the period of the Iranian Air Force in the 1960s buying up the very cheap and lightweight F-5E Tiger II. And of course, the F5A and B Freedom Fighter versions of the F5, of course, in the early 1960s. So you kind of think of the Israeli and the um, Iranian Air Force, the Imperial Iranian Air Force, being kind of more or less in their infancies, kind of, you, I guess you could say, in terms of American supplied air power in the late nine, uh, in the 19, mid to late 1960s. You've got a whole heck of a lot of. Um, F-5s in Iran, and a whole heck of a lot of Mystiers and Mirage 3s and these kinds of things, French jets that are lightweight and more or less cheap aircraft in Israel. And then you get towards 1970, and you see this is where the parallels of the Iranian Air Force and the Israeli Air Force really, really come together quite strongly. Let's check our taxi diagram here, make sure we're going the right spot. Um, and that's when both nations became massive F-4 Phantom users, being, um, with Iran actually being the largest F-4 Phantom buyer um, out there. Um, of course, Israel only bought the F-4E, the Echo variant, with the internal M61 Vulcan cannon. Um, of course, Iran bought a ton of F-4Es as well, but they also bought earlier on, starting in 1968-1969, the F-4D Phantom II. So both countries are massive F-4 Phantom operators. And both countries had some engagements, combat engagements, in which they weren't necessarily entirely happy with the F-4 Phantom. Israel, both Israel and Iran, had the same experience that the Americans had, or of course we had, myself being an American, um, in the Vietnam War. Of course, you know, Israel's Vietnam was the Yom Kippur War, and uh, Iran had border skirmishes with the Soviet Union, um, border skirmishes with Iraq, as well as involvement in the Yemeni's civil war during the 1960s. And in those conflicts, both nations saw the deficiencies of the F-4 Phantom in relation to... Oh, don't really have ATC in this, we're just flying... Fly, flying in single player right now. Like I said, I promised myself I wasn't going to do a bazillion edits to this video. We're just, you know, going right off the cuff here. Um, so we're seeing that kind of both nations really like the F-4. They really adore the F-4, but they realize that they need something not necessarily to replace the F-4 because they are such workhorses, but something to supplement the F-4. Um, you know, the uh, a lot of Israeli pilots thought of the F-4 as being kind of clunky. It's a fantastic multi-role aircraft. It's not necessarily a great um, air superiority pure fighter. Much better as an interceptor. And so the Israelis were really trying to shoehorn the F-4 into being both a uh, air superiority fighter and a ground attack aircraft. Whereas in Israeli usage, the F-4 is more suited to the ground attack kind of role, whereas their lighter weight, smaller, uh, zippier, single seat like Mirage 3s and Nashirs, which of course is stole the stolen plans from France of the Mirage 5, 
um, and then later the Kefir would, would be. They're kind of the lighter weight, more air superiority focused aircraft. So we'll go ahead and disregard the whole short line and just taxi on out. Um, hopefully we don't get a phone number from the tower. But anyway, um, we'll just go ahead and get lined up here. Whereas in Iran, you've got the Iranians, the Imperial Iranians, using the F-4 more or less in its designed air-to-air -air role of being a long-range interceptor, rather than necessarily being an air superiority fighter, which both the U.S. and Israel had kind of shoehorned the F-4 into being. Um, and so that kind of led, leads us to the split between why Israel and why um, Iran went two different ways, because they're looking for an additional aircraft in their armed services to support and you know add to their F-4 fleets, not to replace their F-4 fleets. Israel's looking to replace its Mirage 3s and you know its, its older aircraft types, maybe even get rid of some of the earlier Nashir type aircraft, as well as um, Iran not so much looking to replace aircraft, but definitely looking to bring it online another type to get rid of all of its older F-86 um, and much, much older first generation type of jets. So we'll continue the story once we get up into the air. So we'll go ahead and we'll push our F-14A into zone five. We have a little slight crosswind, but nothing I don't think we can handle here. And we'll gently rotate up off the deck. <laughs> Not the cleanest takeoff in the world, but we'll let the nose come down. And we'll build up some airspeed. And so as we were saying, there's two very different requirements for these two services, the Imperial Iranian Air Force and, of course, the Israeli Air Force. And we can also see the two very vastly different geographical situations these countries are in. You've also got the different threats that these countries are facing. And so let's go ahead and talk about Israel first. So Israel is a little teeny tiny country, as you guys know, from, you know, of course, flying on the Syrian map, you know, you're out of, you take off from Ramat David, you're out of Israeli airspace, you know, within, whoop, uh, air to ground, landing mode. You're out of Israeli airspace within seconds if you're going fast enough. And of course that goes both ways. You know, if you're a Jordanian F-104 flying from Amman, you can get to Tel Aviv in seconds. You know, 30 to 45 seconds if you're going, you know, faster than shit up at 40,000 feet. Um, same thing if you're a Syrian MiG, you're a Lebanese hunter, you're a Egyptian MiG, um, whatever it might be. So the Israelis are looking more for a super air superiority fighter to be put into an interceptor role at very close range, whereas the Iranians and what they're facing is what we see around us here. Vast, a vast, vast country. The size, if not a little bit bigger than Texas, um, with mountains and forests and deserts and just all kinds of different terrain. And then of course you've got the fact that one country is a democracy and one country is a dictatorship. Now, of course, we can argue the merits of, you know, the dictatorship before and post-revolution, but, you know, me being an American, I am always going to say that, you know, the Shah is probably a more benevolent type of dictator. You know, I think I'll, we can all see that, you know, women didn't have to hide their faces prior to 1979, crazy shit like that, you know? But... So the Iranians are trying to cover all this ground, not to mention that they have and share a border 
with the Soviet Union. It landed a pr pretty long there, way on the far side. Go ahead and get the speed brakes in. We'll get the afterburner cooking, and we'll lift off again. Hopefully a better lift off this time. Gears coming up. Flaps coming up. And we'll get the trim nose down. There we go. And we'll gain a little bit more airspeed here. Man, these TF-30s are rough. <laughs> it feels like we're going so slow. Um, so anyway, you've got, like I said, you've got this really mountainous, very vast country that borders the Soviet Union. You've got a massive, um, you know, area of water to the south of Iran in the Persian Gulf. You've got uh, the long mountainous and de flat desert frontier with Iraq. And of course, you've got Pakistan in the east. You've got a much larger country to defend, to put it mildly. And you've got the very annoying and nuisance of, and what was a humiliation to the Shah of Iran, was the fact that um, Soviet MiG-25 RBs, which were essentially, you know, the Soviet version of the SR-71 at the time, of course, nowhere near the performance of an SR-71 or an ox cart, uh, A-12 ox cart, or any of those types of, you know, spy planes that the U.S. had at the time, but more or less an, an analogous kind of high-flying, high-speed reconnaissance aircraft. There's nothing in the world that could touch a MiG-25 RB until the F-14 and the F-15. And so it was Iran's more top priority to get a pure interceptor that could reach out and touch the Soviet threats that were threatening the frontiers of Iran, rather than protecting necessarily the heartland of the tiny country of Israel. And so, you, you know, of course I talked about the politics of these two countries. When the Shah wants something, and because he's an aviation geek, he gets what he wants. So. You know, the two countries, more or less the same time, uh, you know, early 1970s to early mid-1970s, Iran and Israel go shopping at the same time for their next new fighter jet. And, the, of course, what are the two fighter jets that are brand new on the market from the West? That's going to be the F-14A Tomcat and the F-15A Eagle. And so both countries evaluate the jets. Both countries send representatives to fly the jets and to, of course, um, evaluate them and see which one is uh, good to fly. There are very rare photos. I can't find them. Um, if someone knows of a link to them on the internet and would like to share them with me, I would more. I would love to share that link with you guys. Um, and that is, you know, pictures of Israeli pilots flying the F-14. I know they're out there, I know there's documents about what Israel thought about the F-14, but they're just incredibly, incredibly difficult to find. Um, there's more documentation about Iranian pilots. Let's go. Speed brakes in. And... This runway's a little bit bumpy. There's more documentation about Iranian pilots testing the F-14, or, or sorry, the F-15, than there are documentations on Israeli pilots testing the F-14. And so, you know, we all know the famous uh, story of the F-14 and F-15 being, you know, flown and demonstrated for the Shah of Iran in a bit of a fly-off that, uh, you know, is fit for the type of governance that the Shah had and fostered in his country. You know, he's the king, he's the emperor, um, whatever he says goes. So of course he came to the United States and the F-14 and the F-15 were pitted against each other in an air show. Um, the F-15 went first and as we all know, the, F the Air Force tends to have a little bit, they tend to go a little bit easier on their airplanes when uh, they fly in air shows. Uh, but of course they put on a great show for the Shah, you know, flying hard in the F 
F-15, showing the capabilities of the jet, you know, doing um, uh, Viking takeoffs, uh, high speed, you know, passes, hard G poles, full afterburner in the pattern, all these kinds of things that you would expect from a company, McDonnell Douglas, wanting to sell billions of dollars worth of fighter jets to a despot, essentially. And so you kind of get uh, a good sense of that from this spectacle air show. And of course, you know, the, the US Navy pilots who are getting ready to display the F-14 to the Shah, you know, they get the cheeky idea, because of course, when you're fried a pilot, you gotta be cheating or you're not doing doing it right. Always looking for that advantage over your opponent, right? They decide to hop, hop in their jet, flip on the engines a little bit quicker, um, and just sit there idling on the tarmac, waiting for the F-15 dudes to get done with their display. And of course, by the time the F-14 is ready to go for its turn, going second after the F-15, the F-14 is lower on fuel. And we all know if you're flying TF-30 engine F-14s, you want to have as little weight on the jet as possible. And so the F-14 crew went about completely beating up the entire air show box, just putting on a hell of a display that, of course, somebody like the Shah, where it's, you know, his opinion is all that matters, is going to absolutely love it. And of course, you know, beyond that, we've got the fact that the F-14 is the right jet for uh, Iran, whereas the F-15 isn't. And it really comes down to not just those Navy pilots absolutely beating up the place during that demonstration, but also the fact that the F-14 employs the AIM-54 Phoenix. At the time, it was thought that the F-14 wouldn't be able to actually intercept and fly formation with a MiG-25 Foxbat going Mach 3 up at 60,000 feet over Tehran, but it was known that a Phoenix could absolutely get to and shoot down one of those MiG-25s while um, a good intercept was flown to give the missile the best chance it can possibly have. All right, speed brakes in, coming down the runway, speed brakes are in, flaps coming up. Ooh, really bouncing down the runway, and we're up in the air again. All right, so that was kind of the idea behind the F-14 being in Iran, and it really is, at the time, it was the better aircraft for Imperial Iran than was the F-15. Now, kind of as me and my friend were talking about this, we kind of thought that we all know what happens in history because, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. We know the Islamic Revolution happened and, you know, all this kind of stuff went down. And we're thinking that, you know, it might have been better for at least the Islamic Republic of Iran to have F-15s um, because the fact that it's simpler. No swing wings, single seat cockpit, these kinds of things. Less maintenance all around and probably could have kept a better flyable rate of aircraft that were mission ready with F-15s. Um, than with F-14s without, you know, Western American support. But that's kind of getting away from our main topic here. And then if you look at, say, the F-15 in Israeli service, you know, the Israeli pilots, they come from, it's not necessarily an air show for a despot, it's more of a methodical going through and researching, flying the aircraft, talking to representatives from both the U.S. Navy and the Air Force, and figuring out what jet is best for Israel, which there really was no doubt that the F-15 was going to be better for Israel, right? You don't need an AIM-54 when you're taking off from Tel Aviv and engaging targets within 30 seconds. There's no need for that. Um, but they went ahead and tested it anyway, and they really thought that the... From what I've read from these very, you know, not necessarily secretive, but just rare documents about Israeli pilots and what they thought of the F-14, was they thought, oh, it's just a, just an upgraded F-4, essentially. It's got two pilots, super complex radar system, um, you know, high workload for both the pilot and the Rio. It's not what we want. We want a replacement for a Mirage 3, single seat, lightweight, F-15 is not lightweight, of course, um, but, you know, is all about not a single pound for air to ground. 
which we all know the Israelis turned their F-15s into strike aircraft pretty early on in 1984-85 period to strike the PLO headquarters in Tunis. But that's another kind of digression. Um, so we kind of get into um, why, you know, essentially they thought the F-14 was just another F-4. Um, heavy, heavier than the F-15, swing wing, more maintenance, um, you know, not nearly as good of just flat out raw speed performance um, between the F-14 and F-15. This is the A versions we're talking about here. Um, so for a number of factors, Israel just kind of realized right off the bat that the F-15 was going to be better for their Air Force than the F-14, which feet. when you look at it, it's really, there's really no contest there. Um, and then, of course, you get into the idea of, you know, Is Israel, of course, then got the uh, F-16, was one of the first users of the F-16. And kind of an interesting sideshow there is Iran was shopping for its replacement for the F-5 Tigers. So both their F-5 A and B Freedom Fighters, as well as their, their D and uh, E Tiger Twos. All right, trying to talk while doing a touch and go, not always a good idea. All right, got our gear coming up. And why don't we go ahead and change over to left traffic. And so you had Imperial Iran essentially ordering the F-16A in early uh, to late, uh, sorry, late 1978. And so you had uh, them trying to replace their F-5s, essentially, their Freedom Fighters and their Tiger Twos. And Israel was also, you know, another parallel between these two air forces, Israel was also um, in, at the same time looking and shopping to get rid of the rest of their lightweight fighters. Their, um, the rest of their Mirage 3s, some of their early Nashirs, as well as uh, some of their A4 Skyhawks, um, eventually a replacement for the A4 Skyhawk. Um, and so you've got Israel also looking at the F-16. And as we all know, the um, Islamic Revolution happened, all of that nastiness, and there were already F-16s on the production line for Imperial Iran. So we'll get the flaps down, we'll get the gear down. So Iran already has F-16s being built for them, and the first Iranian F-16 was actually already painted up in Asia Minor desert camo with IIAF on the intake. So that's how close F-16s were to being delivered to Iran. Now there's a lot of like myth mythos out there and speculation that a couple F-16s actually got to Iran and there's really no substantiated evidence of that happening. Um, there was some support infrastructure, like I believe some batteries for different components of the F-16 had already been delivered. The crew ladders for, you know, of course, getting a pilot into the cockpit were already delivered, which, you know, in, uh, you know, different from a Navy airplane, the F-14, F-14 has a built-in crew ladder because you don't want crew ladders sliding around the deck of an aircraft carrier. So, you know, the F-16 crew ladders were already delivered, things like that. Infrastructure things were already delivered. A couple, um... Uh, you know, civilian technicians were already over there preparing the IIAF for the delivery of the F-16, etc. But no actual F-16s over there. And the initial batch of F-16s that Israel received as a result of the peace deal with Egypt was, of course, those F-16s that were earmarked for delivery to Iran. Very interesting and another kind of parallel between these two air forces. And I think it's just really interesting because there's a lot more kind of camaraderie between Israel and Iran in the late 1960s, throughout the 1970s, until 1979, that people realize. There were quite a few exchange tours um, between the two air forces. There were Iranian pilots who flew F-4 Phantoms during the Yom Kippur War in 1973 in Israel, and similarly there were Israeli pilots who flew 
recon missions over the Soviet Union in Imperial Iranian Air Force aircraft, very similarly to the um, USAF pilots who flew um, Imperial Iranian F-4s over uh, the Soviet Union on re super secret recon missions. And a number of American pilots uh, lost their lives to SAMs in Iranian F-4s flying recon missions over the Soviet Union with a number of engagements with MiGs, SAM sites, AAA, all these kinds of things. And it's kind of a hidden history that a lot of people don't know these days because um, Iran is, of course, and rightly so, vilified by the media, so people don't really look into this kind of stuff. So just a kind of a very interesting little discussion, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. There's no, you know, Israel was right, Iran was wrong kind of thing. Um, but. You know, just an interesting discussion about uh, what happened and just kind of some historical facts about why Israel and why Iran chose the aircraft they went for right at the same time they were shopping for an advanced and larger uh, fighter jet. I think it is the only kind of interesting question that will obviously never be answered because it's counterfactual, is if Iran had gone with the F-15A instead of the F-14A, I believe that their mission capable rates would have been a lot higher and there would be more flyable F-15s today than there are F-14As today. Simply because you got the added workflow, or added maintenance work of, you know, two cockpits, swing wing, big ol' AUG-9, not that the uh, radar in the F-15 is not any less complicated, but just a little bit easier to deal with the maintenance stress in an F-15 than in an F-14. Uh, However, you can also kind of turn that coin and be like, well, you know, the F-14 being a Navy aircraft is built stronger, you know, it's Grumman, iron, tough, it's, uh, you know, it's built to be used and abused on an aircraft carrier. Maybe that lent the F-14 to being more airworthy in the long run um, in Iranian service, um, far, far and away and longer after the cutoff of Western support for their F-14s. So it's it's just a really interesting question, I think. Um, and it's just an interesting addendum to the question as to why Israel went with the F-15 and why is uh, Iran went with the F-14. So we'll go ahead and make this one a full stop and we'll wrap up this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it and thought it was interesting. Um, so if you did like it, please give us a like and a subscribe, and we're very much nearing that very close uh, threshold to that very big milestone of 30,000 subscribers, which is nothing to shake a stick at. It definitely doesn't suck, and it's really awesome. And you guys who have supported the channel, um, both with your likes and as well as on Patreon, are definitely, definitely awesome. That's for sure. And... It's great that part of my income and being able to do this kind of stuff is, and as well as, you know, funding my own real life flying to a certain extent is just being an airplane geek on YouTube and enjoying this amazing simulator that is DCS World. I mean, there is truly nothing like it out there. And a big thank you to Eagle Dynamics for putting this together. And a big thank you to the third parties like like uh, Heatler for the F-14 that we're enjoying today in this video, or um, Razbam with their Aviate B Harrier 2. And there are just so many awesome upcoming modules for DCS that are gonna be incredibly fantastic as well. I'm looking forward to the A6, of course, like everybody else. Uh, Mirage F-1, really looking forward to that and playing the bad guys on the Persian Gulf with the Mirage F-1, whether I'm sinking tankers or, or flying against uh, American aircraft in an Iranian F-1. Um, you know, all these kinds of things will be a ton of fun. Uh, the F-8 Crusader, of course, A-7E Corsair II. It'll be awesome to have carrier decks that are diverse again. Um, so, you know, uh, aircraft carrier decks these days are very undiverse. It's all growlers and hornets, right? So it'll be awesome to get back to the days, at least in DCS, of having drumsticks, sloughs, turkeys, and bugs all on the same deck. That'll be very cool. And hey, maybe someone will make a 
uh, KA3D Sky Warrior. That'd be pretty freaking cool to have a big old whale on the deck as well um, in DCS World. That'd be pretty freaking cool in my opinion. Um, and of course the F upcoming F15E, which is the jet that will make me able to die happy because I absolutely love the F15E. Um, it's my favorite jet, modern jet that is, and uh, Razbam, definitely get on that because I can't wait for it, that's for sure. So that was fun. That was the first round of touch and goes I've ever done in the F14A, and that was really interesting. Um, you know, I probably rotated at too low of an airspeed a couple times. I probably rotated at too high of an airspeed a couple times. But it's kind of difficult to get a good reading and judge on that in DCS world. Because um, you can't feel the jet at all. you got to have your eyes absolutely glued on the airspeed indicator. Um, and, of course, we got our Israeli F-15 back here hanging out. Um, and we'll just kind of come back up to him and park next to him. And if you guys enjoyed this kind of more discussion type video about kind of the historical uh, implications of Iran picking the F-14 and Israel picking the F-15, definitely let me know in the comment section and I'll definitely be uh, oh, way open to doing more videos like this. Um, it's just a quick and dirty, easy video to make and uh, I'm such a perfectionist. My average video in terms of number of takes is probably somewhere around 52-ish takes to make a video for you guys, so this is, you know, boom, done in one take, which is kind of nice, um, kind of gives me a little bit of a break, so um, if you guys like this kind of video, please let me know, and again, thank you for all your support, and we're almost at 30,000 subscribers, which is pretty freaking cool, if you ask me, so uh, fly safe out there, guys, and of course, stay healthy, if you're a pilot in real life, definitely, definitely stay healthy, because you know, AMEs are starting to shy away from renewing medicals for pilots who have contracted and had COVID in the past because of lingering uh, kind of issues there. So just be very careful out there, guys. Um, and uh, like I said, fly safe and uh, stay healthy.